Hello, and welcome to Scott's Odyssey. Today I was driving around the southern portion of Huntington County, Pennsylvania, when I saw a weird set of small pillars on the side of the road that said something about a picnic area. And just a quick short distance away was another one of these pillars identifying that the other location was moved to this location and renamed. Well, let's take a look at why there are two randomly dedicated pillars sitting on the side of the road. See you in a minute. Welcome back. If you've watched my videos before, thank you for your patronage, and if you're new to Scott's Odyssey, welcome aboard. So I identified that I was just driving along and saw some structures and decided to stop and see what it was all about. Now you may initially think it's just a marker for a driveway or the edge of a property, which is common throughout all the United States and I think in a lot of other countries as well. Whether it marks your driveway for easy viewability or Maybe it's a vanity marker to make you seem like you have an invisible gate before entering your domain. The end result is the same. You have a stone of some sort dominating the entrance and adding either a marker, some sort of grandeur or a mystery to what lies beyond. Well, as it would turn out, these stone pillars fall into the role of marker, mystery and grandeur. They are identified as markers for the Grand Army of the Republic Picnic of 1882. And the second one is a marker from 1937, redesignating the Gar Picnic as the Shade Gap Picnic. Let me give you the back history. Gar, you've heard me talk about that acronym before, but usually at a gravesite. G-A-R is an acronym for Grand Army of the Republic. The Grand Army of the Republic was founded by Dr. Benjamin Franklin Stevenson and Reverend William J. Rutledge. Dr. Benjamin Franklin Stevenson was a medical doctor and Army regimental surgeon during the Civil War. Reverend William J. Rutledge was an Army chaplain. Both of these men served in the 14th Illinois Volunteer Infantry during the Civil War. At one point, both were tent mates during the expedition to Meridian, Mississippi in 1864. During their downtime in the expedition, they discussed creating an organization that, and I quote, 
Soldiers so closely allied in the fellowship of suffering would, when mustered out of the service, naturally desire some form of association that would preserve the friendships and the memories of their common trials and dangers. As time would show, their concept came to fruition with the creation of the fraternal order known as the Grand Army of the Republic on April 6, 1866 in Decatur, Illinois. Now, I said fraternal order, but it was only fraternal in name. The reality is there was one official woman and a good handful of unofficial women whom were all recognized for their contributions and losses in the war effort. To be a member of the Grand Army, you must have served honorably in the Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps, or the Revenue Cutter Service, the, the, the Coast Guard. Between the month of April 1861 and December 1865, and you would have had to been honorably discharged from service, never have taken up any arms against the United States. To further deepen the requirements, your membership had to occur at a local post and you had to be voted in once your application was received. So the GAR was essentially what today we would refer to as the American Legion, which is a meeting place and club for all veterans of the US military, or the VFW, meaning the Veterans of Foreign Wars, which is similar to the American Legion with the exception, as its name states, it was for veterans of foreign wars. So you could be a member of the VFW and the Legion, but not everyone in the Legion can be a member of the VFW. Now, each member was voted in using a very peculiar manner, very Masonic manner. The system of voting was that of the Mason's ballot box. A series of white and black balls were cast, and unlike the Masonic single black ball, which means you don't get in, it required more than one black ball to deny you entry into the GAR. By the way, the whole white and black ball determination of voting is where the phrase blackballing came from. Although it's no longer a common phrase today, it was still extremely popular back in the 80s and the 90s. If you happened to get blackballed, your name was entered into a black book to mark your rejection for entry into the GAR. Now, I mentioned women who served in the war. Well, even though women served, the only recorded woman to make it into GAR was Sarah Emma Edmonds, who served in the 2nd Michigan Infantry, disguised as a man by the name of Franklin Thompson, from May 1861 until April of 1863, and, well, continued to live as a man post-war. When she died in 1898, she was given a funeral with full military honors and was reburied in Houston in 1901. Now, there were honorary women admitted into the GAR who served as volunteer nurses, but for the most part, they joined their own organization named the Association of Army Nurses. Whenever an encampment took place, yes, they called their meetings and get-togethers of the post an encampment, just as it was called during the wartime, they often met side by side with the Association of Army Nurses, but the nurses were never granted official membership into the GAR. Every state, with the exception of Hawaii, had a local GAR post. Their headquarters for each post was called a memorial hall, or sometimes a post hall, similar to what the American Legion and VFWs do today. When 15 veterans applied to create post, a post would be created with a number based on the order in which they joined the GAR, and then they would choose a formal name based on someone within their post who was being honored, such as specific comrades, uh, a particular battle, commanding officer, or even an event that they all shared together. Now, for these pillars that I came across, these pillars are representative of the annual encampment and reunion for GAR post number 618, the Captain B.K. Blair post. The first GAR encampment was held in Illinois in 1866. For this site, the first GAR encampment was held on August 8th of 1882, and then it was moved upstream, probably due to flooding or soft wet ground issues, in 1884. Somewhere along the way, the GAR encampment became commonly known as the GAR Picnic. The annual encampment has continued consistently since 1882, and in 1932, due to the fact that we changed how we view the Civil War, 
and now acknowledge that everybody in the war was absolutely an American, and everyone in that war deserved acknowledgement that they were all fighting for their own liberty in the United States, the Gar Encampment picnic area was renamed the Shade Gap Picnic. The Gar Encampment did continue to run under the name of Gar until 1949 in Illinois, when only six official members could be mustered due to the fact that time took away the last whom were alive during the actual Civil War. I would like to thank historian Anthony Waski for being one of the few people who was able to put this information together and actually publish it so that we can all know about the Gar encampments or the Gar picnics. If you know of sites like this, just sitting along the road, leave me a comment or send me a message. As most of those whom do leave comments know, I do respond and I do reach out and I chat with a lot of you all the time and particular members on a very regular basis. After all, this isn't a story about me. It's a story about who we once were and in a lot of instances still are. As always, I thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.